West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com The claims that the election was stolen were so successful. President Trump and his allies raised $250 million, nearly $100 million in the first week after the election. Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren called it the big ripoff. $250 million bucks raised using a lie that the election was stolen. And on this show, we like to follow the money. So let's take a look at what the committee found. Between Election Day and January 6th, the Trump campaign sent scores of emails to their supporters. In the emails were calls to donate to the so-called Official Election Defense Fund to fight voter fraud, even though the campaign knew those claims were absolutely false, as the committee laid out. But here's the even bigger thing. That fund didn't even exist. And the former guy and his allies made a ton of money off of it. On November 9th, 2020, Trump created the Save America PAC. According to investigators, most of that money raised from the so-called Election Defense Fund, well, it went there. That PAC then made millions of dollars of contributions to pro-Trump organizations. And among those organizations, five million bucks went to the company that ran Trump's rally on the ellipse. Watch this. The emails continued through January 6th even as President Trump spoke on the ellipse. 30 minutes after the last fundraising email was sent, the Capitol was breached. Then there's Kimberly Guilfoyle, Don Jr.'s fiance. She spoke for less than three minutes on the 6th. The Washington Post reported she was paid 60,000 bucks for that little speech by the conservative nonprofit Turning Point Action. And the sponsoring donor? the 72-year-old heiress of the Publix grocery store chain. For more, let's bring in the expert, Syracuse law professor David K. Johnson. He also wrote The Big Cheat, How Donald Trump Fleeced America and Enriched Himself and His Family. David, you might need to write a whole other book on this alone. You have been covering this man since the Atlantic City casino days in the 80s. Does any of this surprise you? He's always done it. No, he's not never at all. had to pay a price. Uh, Donald is Donald is the third generation head of a four generation white collar crime family that dates back to the late 1800s. And they have been doing this all their lives. You know, when, it, when you lose a, a campaign, it's impossible to raise money. Why would anybody give you money? You lost. Donald figured out how to turn it into a quarter billion dollar and growing money machine. So you're pretty confident that Trump fundraising off the big lie is just a big fraud? Oh, uh, absolutely. And I think he's vulnerable to a uh, federal charge of mail and wire fraud. And uh, you'll hear a lot of people say, well, there's a disclosure in the fine print that says we may use the money for something else. 
Well, I've talked to some federal prosecutors, and uh, Lawrence Tribe, uh, the Harvard constitutional scholar, also agrees uh, that he's vulnerable to this. And the uh, argument could be made by prosecutors that Trump knew that this was a scam, so he put in the, well, we might spend the money on something else provision as a part of that scam. Now, in addition to that, a fraud, which is always and everywhere a crime, is also a civil offense. And every state has a civil fraud law. And so uh, state attorneys general under consumer protection laws could also go after Trump uh, for his fundraising deception. Could, but do you think they really will? Because here's the thing, David, as a lifetime or multi-generational scammer, he knows exactly how to use these loopholes. So what makes one think they're going to get him this time? Remember when he was in office and we said, wow, when he's not the president anymore, he is going to be in so much trouble. Wait till they see all the money he made at the Trump Hotel and so on and so forth. But he's sitting pretty down at Mar-a-Lago. Well, you hit upon the core problem here, which I assign to feckless Democrats. Uh, the Manhattan grand jury was the case to bring. Alvin Bragg, the new attorney general, shut it down, which caused his two top very experienced prosecutors to resign as a, uh, uh, as a matter of principle. Now, the governor of New York, Kathy Hochul, who's a Democrat, has unfettered authority to take any criminal case away from a district attorney and turn it over to another prosecutor. She didn't do it. Letitia James, the state attorney general, who's made a lot of noise about how she's going after Trump in a civil case, uh, won't answer the question, did you ask Governor Hochul to reassign this case to your office and give you criminal authority? Carl Racine, the uh, attorney general of Washington, D.C., he had a case over the tens of millions of dollars from the Trump inaugural, where they went, never explained. There's a chapter in my book about the efforts to take money off the books illegally, criminal acts. Did he pursue that? No, he took a $750,000 fine and shut it down. So there's only Fannie Willis, the uh, district attorney in the county that overlays Atlanta, pursuing her voter fraud case left. And perhaps Merrick Garland will authorize a case. There does seem to be an investigation going on by the Department of Justice. But yeah, I don't understand why these Democrats talk a big game and then fold. OK, then let's go back, because when he was president, Democrats would say they need to put new laws in place to prevent future presidents from abusing the norms the way Trump did. Have you seen right. any effort to create new laws, rules, regulations? Because last I checked, Trump could run for president tomorrow and he still wouldn't have to submit his taxes. Right. There have been some bills introduced, but nothing has uh, happened. And in fact, the United States Supreme Court, in a long story of decisions we get to a whole other segment about, have moved in the direction of basically legalizing bribery and criminal conduct by elected officials, by narrowing and narrowing and narrowing the uh, uh, ability of prosecutors to bring cases against people who are elected to office and abuse their power for their own benefit. David, this evening's 11th hour broadcast has been brought to you by the letter F for feckless and fraud. It is Thursday, the 16th of June of 2022, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner is the English Bulldog, and he is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. Oh, and just to let you know, in the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's, the recipe for my Metro Shrimp and Grits is uh, there for your perusal. A little complicated. I have some friends who believe that you should never have more than three ingredients in a dish. Otherwise, it's too extravagant. Sorry. <laughs> this humble shrimp and grits meal is a little complex by those standards, then. My God. Anyway, uh, we cook like we cook at home. Don't we? <laughs> at least we do here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Because most of the cookbooks are for people who want to cook at home. 
Yeah, that's why you have a cookbook. Okay, got that out of the way. Anyway, it is J6 day again. Oh yeah, we had a bit of a delay during the weekend. I was, I was like wondering what the hell's going on. Did somebody else claim to ha- that that they had to leave to deliver a baby? Anyway, speaking of which, if Stepian doesn't post any pics of the delivery, it didn't happen. I'm just saying. So, uh, looks like Loudermilk has uh, spilled the beans. Except he doesn't know it because he's a dupe. At the best, he's a dupe. Because I kind of think maybe he's in on it. Notice the knee-jerk reaction that when Mikey Sherrill leveled the charges that his group and others seemed to be casing the joint and he immediately wanted to censor her, kick her out of the Congress. Yeah, who does that? Well, Republicans, because any any charge by a Democrat has to be met ten times as worse, because that's the Trumpian way. He only stated it many times, even in Art of the Deal. Someone comes at you, you come at them ten times as bad. Wow, that sounds humane. You mean there's no willingness to meet in the middle somewhere? <laughs> yeah, because the middle won't be the middle, ever. Which brings to mind some of the other knee-jerk Republican behavior that was exemplified by Louder Milk's response is um, lying. Just out and out lying, saying, oh, the J6 committee didn't send me anything to talk to them about what I saw. And that's an out and out lie. I mean, (laughs) I'll, I'll just reiterate once again. Do they really think we're as stupid as the people who vote for them? Because I think they think that that's all that matters, which is part of their eliminationist uh, rhetoric, their eliminationist uh, belief. Because they've only been behaving like that for how many decades now? Anything that a Democrat does has no legitimacy. We saw that happen with the Clintons. In many ways, we saw it happen with Jimmy Carter. A good man. And a good man has to be brought down low. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, he was such a doddering old fool. No, he wasn't. He was sabotaged and stabbed in the back. Okay. But that was by design, because what happened to Nixon, they didn't want to have ever happen again. The same actors caught up in Nixon's scandal are the same leading lights now, Roger Stone. You don't think he's a leading light? Well, he's a motivator. He is, well, they call him a dirty trickster, but that's a nice way of saying that, you know, he's uh, something, he, he even called it something a little worse, right? We, and we all know what that is. Even Manafort, They were all part of the same lobby shop. And then they went and honed their skills in the crumbling Soviet Union. And then when the Soviet Union crumbled, they went and practiced their their, uh, Green Bay sweep to make sure that democracy would not arise, at least in the countries that they were set up shop at. That's what Rudy was doing. Which also reminds me, now that the Jenny is out of the bottle, uh, is, is that why Rudy got drunk with power? I wonder. Yeah, so is is Roberts that balls and strikes umpire judge that he claims to be? Is he going to really look into these leaks? Hmm? That there was some sort of wild discussion about being able to overthrow an election? among the justices on the court. Let us not forget that John Roberts was part of the Brooks Brothers riot. He was sent down to Florida to counsel Jeb Bush. And then when he did his work, GW appointed him to the Supreme Court as Chief Justice. Balls and strikes. That's why the foul balls by the Republicans are always called hits. 
Sometimes doubles. Not just a hit. Sometimes you get a double, triple home run. All right. And they call themselves institutionalists. Mm -hmm. At least we got that going for us. Well, why don't we actually delve into what we have curated for you today? Because uh, we take some time to curate these uh, morsels of information for your intellectual culinary dining pleasure. Mm Mm-hmm. All right. Well, starting off at the top, the J6 committee revealed that Trump raised 250 million bucks for an election fraud fund that did not exist. And so David K. Johnson followed the money. And he's been doing that for a few decades. On the rest of the menu here as we begin on this fine Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The New Mexico Supreme Court ordered a MAGA-dominated county commission to certify the vote. And that was in an emergency session, by the way. The chief public health official in Virginia says he doesn't care about woke science. And there is no structural racism causing racial disparities in health care, period. That's Yunkin's guy. And the U.S. Supreme Court dismissed an attempt spearheaded by Arizona to defend a Trump-era immigration policy that made it harder for immigrants to get green cards. Cruelty is always the point, you know. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where agents from the Commerce Department and the FBI are probing how American electronics wound up in Russian military gear. And the European Union sued the UK over its unilateral move to rewrite the trade rules agreed to when that country left the EU two years ago. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. At netrootsradio.com, to the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the left of that chat room link across the page, near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, is the link to our Patreon page. And please do become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio. We need to pay our bills. And we found that when we pay our bills, it allows us to fly under the radar and continue this resistance against those dark forces are arrayed not only against the United States of, of America, but really and truly representative democracy around the world. We uh, stand as, well, you know, our little form of resistance, and we have you to thank. If you could send us what you might spend on an espresso-type coffee drink once a month, Send those funds to us once a month. It does help us pay our bills and then fly under the radar and continue this powerhouse of resistance against those dark forces that we just mentioned. And we thank you for your generosity and pre-thank you for generosity in the future. Thanks. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that. Thanks, Tom. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. And then I really do try to get those uh, show notes and links linked up on Twitter and other social media platforms. But you can always find the show notes and links at Daily Co's. And one way to find that is to follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. Oh, yeah. 
follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, really wherever podcasts can be found. Deezer, you can get it on Deezer. But you can only get the deep archive of the Netroots Radio Library from the last 11 years at the Internet Archive at archive.org. So do. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is by Annie Gowan out of the Washington Post. The New Mexico Supreme Court yesterday, Wednesday, ordered the county commissioners in rural Otero County to do their jobs and certify election results two days after they refused, citing unsubstantiated concerns about fraud. The court granted the emergency motion by New Mexico Secretary of State Maggie Toulouse Oliver, a Democrat, because we have to say that apparently, who earlier this week asked the court to intervene and compel the three-member board to approve vote totals from a June 7th primary the commission had voted on Monday not to do so. MAGA dominated. One of the commissioners is the cowboy for Trump MAGA, who has a date in court, by the way, on Friday. For what? Yeah. Ah, breaking and entering and trespassing. And pretty much, you know, disrupting the peaceful transfer of power. Just saying. The move had potentially disenfranchised every Otero County voter who legally and securely cast a ballot and harmed candidates seeking to have their names on the general election ballot in November, Oliver argued. A spokesman for Oliver, Alex Curtis, said that office was also pursuing a criminal referral with the state's attorney general, which could result in the commissioners being charged with contempt of court or removed from office if they do not follow the court's instructions. Yeah, one of the commissioners said, what are they going to do to me? Throw me in the hoo-ha? This is Terra Nova. It's unchartered territory, said Curtis. Hopefully it does not come to that. The commissioner's refusal has thrust the small county of 66,000 on the Texas border into the national spotlight at a time of rising concern over the long-term damage from former President Donald Trump's repeated claim that the 2020 election was stolen from him, the so-called big lie. The deadline to certify the primary election results is Friday. Under state law, county boards must prove there were discrepancies in election returns if they decline to certify results so far. The commissioners have only said they generally are distrustful of state officials and the electronic voting machines. This is what cracks me up. We've been arguing about these machines being uh, manipulated since uh, Bush Co. And now they're upset about it. At state are the results of the primary for the county's one state house seat and several other positions, including district court judge, county assessor, and county sheriff. Because, of course, we all know that a county sheriff has more power than the president of the United States or anybody on the Supreme Court because they are constitutional sheriffs. Otero County Commissioner... Coy Griffin, who is scheduled to be sentenced this Friday for trespassing at the Capitol during the January 6, 2021 riot. It was not a riot. It was an insurrection. You can call it that. I know it's more letters and characters than riot. Well, he said the board continues to have concerns about election security even after three official audits of the 2020 results and a partisan review by volunteers turned up no evidence of widespread fraud. In fact, the only fraud that anybody's been able to find is maggots voting for their dead wives, voting for their dead mothers, voting for their dead husbands, voting three or four times for Donald Trump because they just wanted to be sure.
Jenna Portnoy of the Washington Post brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. In five months on the job, Virginia's chief public health official, Colin Green, has rejected the state-recognized declaration that racism is a public health crisis and downplayed the role of racism in health disparities, leaving some fearful for their jobs, and I might add some patients fearful for their health. The head of the office that helps vulnerable mothers and their babies said a run-in with Green left her and her team traumatized, ashamed, and uncertain the programs they shepherded through a pandemic could continue under the new administration. She said he gaslighted staffers and reduced one to tears. Green said, He wants staff to be accountable for their work and doubting the well-established link between structural racism and health disparities plans to create an investigative unit within the Department of Health to start fresh on, for example, reasons for high rates of black maternal and infant mortality. He wants to reinvent the wheel just without any woke racism in it. His approach dovetails with efforts by the administration of Glenn Youngkin to reverse work done under Governor Ralph Northam to acknowledge and address all forms of racism, including rescinding policies intended to further diversity, equity, and inclusion in schools because that's what racists do. Green's philosophical opposition to considering racism as a scientific variable in public health runs counter to a groundswell of experts embracing the need to confront root causes of health disparities while the nation grapples with a legacy of racist policies. Green maintains that racism is a politically charged word that will alienate white people. Well, give me an effort break. Who cares? It doesn't. The only white people that would offend are racists. If you say racism, you're blaming white people, Green said. Really? Only white people are racist? That's quite a racist statement there, Mr. Green. Enough of the world thinks that's what you're saying, that you've lost a big piece of your audience. I guess in his world of racism, which is a very small, petty world, everybody must feel that way. In a follow-up interview not long after the mass shooting in Evaldi, he expanded on his concerns. It's not just the word racism, he said. For example, when people use the term gun violence, I have a problem with that, too. Gun violence is, frankly, a Democratic talking point. When you use that term, every Republican in the room is going to walk out, he said. So what you're saying is that when people are brainwashed, They have a right to be brainwashed. And those who are not brainwashed and are naming a behavior exactly what it is. (laughs) Okay, Mr. Green. Green's objections to Frank talk about racism stretch back years before Yunkin picked him for the top job to when he was a local health director in rural northwestern Virginia documents obtained by the Washington Post through the state's open records law shows. Green came to Richmond ready to enforce Yunkin's order making mask mandates optional in schools and ready to refocus the agency on boosting vaccinations in rural Virginia where rates lagged among a conservative, mostly white population. And I wonder why that was. A 63-year-old retired Army physician, Green said his views on race were shaped in part by 30 years of the most diverse branch of the military, an institution the AP reported last year leaves some service members with no recourse for the discrimination they endure.
Robert Barnes of the Washington Post brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The Supreme Court yesterday, Wednesday, dismissed an attempt by Republican-led states to defend a Trump-era immigration policy that made it harder for immigrants to obtain green cards, which has been abandoned by the Biden administration. In a one-sentence order, the court dismissed the case spearheaded by the state of Arizona as improvidently granted. That means that after oral arguments in the case in February, the justices decided they should have not gotten involved in the first place, but in an unusual concurring opinion, Balls and Strikes Chief Justice John G. Roberts Jr. accused the Biden administration of apparent gamesmanship in abandoning the rule after lower courts ruled against it. He raised questions shared by other justices when the court heard oral arguments in the case about whether the administration was skirting the legal requirements that apply when a presidential administration vacates a policy of its predecessor. Where was the concern when Trump vacated whole departments of our government? The administration's maneuvers could be seen as an attempt to avoid judicial review of whether, quote, the government's actions all told comport with the principles of administrative law, Roberts wrote. He said a mare's nest of procedural problems stood in the way of the court making such a decision, however, and his words read more like a warning for the future. It was joined by Thomas, Alito, and Gorsuch. The court must rule before the end of the term on another Biden administration case involving immigration, involving lower court decisions that had kept the administration from ending a Trump-imposed remain in Mexico requirement that keeps asylum seekers along the southern border outside the U.S. while their cases are being decided. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. Hi, and welcome to COVID Quickly, a Scientific American podcast series. This is your fast track update on the COVID pandemic. We bring you up to speed on the science behind the most urgent questions about the virus and the disease. We demystify the research and help you understand what it really means. I'm Tanya Lewis. I'm Josh Fishman. And we're Scientific American Senior Health Editors. Today, vaccines for the littlest kids may be almost here. And new evidence about long COVID shows who gets it most often and what the most common symptoms are. It's been nearly a year and a half since COVID vaccines were authorized for adults in the U.S., yet kids under five are still not eligible, even though testing in children began over six months ago. Could this be about to change, Tanya? Possibly. I can understand why many parents are frustrated. They've been told for months that a vaccine is right around the corner, but there have been some promising developments. Like what? Have there been good results from these tests? Just a couple of weeks ago, vaccine maker Moderna announced it was filing for emergency use authorization for its vaccine for kids ages six months to six years. And Pfizer recently announced in a press release that its vaccine was 80% effective at preventing symptomatic COVID in kids under five, although they haven't made the data public yet. Does that get us any closer to getting a green light from the FDA, though? Well, SIAM contributor Charlie Schmidt asked experts about when we can expect a vaccine for the littlest ones, what the reasons are for the holdup, and more. The FDA's Advisory Committee for Vaccines is scheduled to meet June 8th, 21st, and 22nd to discuss making younger children eligible. Did Charlie get any inkling about what might happen in these meetings? He spoke with Arnold Monto, acting chair of the Advisory Committee and an epidemiologist at the University of Michigan School of Public Health. 
Monto said the FDA could issue an EUA for kids within a day or two of those meetings, but, quote, there are no guarantees. One possibility is the committee could recommend authorizing the vaccine only for kids who are high risk or immunocompromised. But why not just authorize it for all the kids? Well, the FDA has a very high bar for approving new vaccines or other biological products for children. Kids already have a pretty low risk of serious outcomes from COVID, so the companies have to show that their vaccines do not cause other problems. So far, they haven't seen any serious safety issues, have they? No, most of the side effects have been mild and similar to those seen in older kids or adults. mRNA vaccines can cause side effects like fever, which may cause seizures in babies and young children. But Moderna and Pfizer have been able to achieve strong immune responses even at fairly low doses, which reduces these risks. And there haven't been any cases of myocarditis, the heart inflammation that occurred in rare cases among teenagers, mostly in boys. So the vaccines appear to be safe. That's good. But how effective are they? That's a great question. Much of the initial data has actually come from looking at the immune response to the vaccine. In other words, the level of so-called neutralizing antibodies produced in people who are given it. By comparing these levels to levels seen in older kids or adults who had good protection against getting COVID, you can extrapolate that protection to young kids. This is known as immunobridging. Okay, so that's looking at parts of the immune system and how they behave. What about real-world effects, though? Did the vaccines lower infection rates in kids? For actual efficacy data, Pfizer has only announced data on about 1,700 kids, showing an efficacy rate for three doses of about 80.3%. Moderna reported a lower efficacy rate of 37 to 51% for its two-dose vaccine in kids under six. Whether or not that will clear the FDA's bar remains to be seen. Ah, interesting. That's kind of a big spread in efficacy. Is the FDA waiting to evaluate Moderna's data until Pfizer's data is in? That's been a point of contention. Politico reported that the agency was holding off on reviewing Moderna's submission until Pfizer's was in. But the FDA commissioner, Robert Califf, told Andy Slavitt, President Biden's former senior advisor for COVID response, on his In the Bubble podcast, that there is, quote, no reason for the FDA to wait to review it. Pfizer expects to submit its data by the time the FDA's advisory committee meets in June, so they may end up reviewing both Pfizer's and Moderna's data at the same time. And like lots of worried parents, we will be watching that closely. It's becoming clear that acute COVID isn't the only consequence of the disease. Long COVID, symptoms that drag on, is a real problem. Two new reports shed some light on who gets it and what it looks like. There's still no strict definition of long COVID, Tanya. But estimates are that between 10 to 30 percent of infected people will have at least one symptom, a real disabling problem that afflicts them at least a month after they've cleared the virus and sometimes for half a year. Often they have several symptoms. I saw a new CDC report that said one out of five infected people could develop long COVID. What are the most common problems? According to a new study, what affects people most often is serious fatigue the kind that exhausts you after walking from one room in your house to another. Then there's trouble catching your breath, loss of smell, headaches, insomnia, and memory trouble. There's also difficulty concentrating, what people often call brain fog. This list comes from new research published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, and it's the first report from a long-term study being done by the National Institutes of Health. These people were all assessed six weeks after testing positive for the virus. Are a lot of these people older? Because age seems to make people more vulnerable to COVID. Advanced age actually doesn't seem to be a big risk factor, Tanya. In fact, people aged 39 to 50 are most likely to be diagnosed with post-COVID conditions. That fact comes from a huge analysis of private health insurance claims done on more than 78,000 people collected by a nonprofit group called Fair Health. They did find that women were more likely than men to have long-lasting problems, didn't they? About 60% compared with about 40%? Yes, they did. One other big finding was that severe disease wasn't a risk factor. Three quarters of these people hadn't been hospitalized, so you can have a mild case and still suffer months later. One of the problems long COVID patients have is that this isn't an easy condition to diagnose. Is there any new info on that? The study really confirmed that difficulty. 
The NIH team put people in their study through blood tests, lung tests, heart tests, and a lot more, and they didn't find a lot of abnormalities. Now, that means the condition is real, but the tests themselves aren't good enough. It's a warning to doctors not to dismiss patients, not to say it's in your head or anything like that. Physicians need to work hard to find tests and treatments because this population is growing as the pandemic continues and they need help. Now you're up to speed. Thanks for joining us. Our show is edited by Jeff Del Vicio and Tulika Bose. Come back in two weeks for the next episode of COVID Quickly. And check out Siam.com for updated and in-depth COVID news. This is a message from CDC. After hurricanes, tornadoes, and floods, standing water and excess moisture help mold grow in your home, garage, and other structures. When you return to a home that has been flooded, know that you're likely to have mold. Mold puts your family's health at risk. If you have mold growing in your home, you should clean it up and fix other water problems, such as leaks in roofs, walls, or plumbing. Keep your children and pets out of affected areas until you've cleaned. Control moisture in your home to prevent mold growth. To remove mold growth from hard surfaces, use commercial products, soap and water, or a bleach solution of no more than one cup of household laundry bleach in one gallon of water. Follow the manufacturer's instructions. Never mix bleach with ammonia or other household cleaners. It will produce dangerous, toxic fumes. Open windows and doors to provide fresh air. For more information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Don't you wish your life came with a warning app? Stop. That dog does not want to be petted. (laughs) Just a little heads up before something bad happens. Move your coffee cup away from your computer. Oh, no, 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 no. So you can have more control. Stop. You're texting your boss by mistake. Uh Uh-oh. Well, life doesn't always give you time to change the outcome. But pre-diabetes does. With early diagnosis and a few healthy changes like managing your weight, getting active, stopping smoking, and eating healthier, you can stop pre-diabetes before it leads to type 2 diabetes. It's easy to learn your risk. Take the one-minute test today at doihaveprediabetes.org. Warning, the cap is loose on that catch-up. Don't wait. You have the power to change the outcome. Visit doihaveprediabetes.org today. That's doihaveprediabetes.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and its prediabetes awareness partners. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our netrootsradio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our netrootsradio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. Netrootsradio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. It's over. Biden's numbers are in the ditch. Democrats are doomed. Call the priest. These are Democrats talking. Even before November's congressional elections are run, many conventional thinking Democratic operatives are surrendering to a presumed Republican sweep. You don't need a political science degree to know that if you start out announcing that you'll lose, chances are you will. After all, who wants to vote for a party that shows no fighting spirit? No confidence in the appeal of its own ideas. What's happening here is that the party's top leaders have decided their candidates can't win in rural areas and smaller factory cities, so they've quit trying. Worse, they blame the voters, claiming that Trumpism, Fox News BS, and culture war nonsense have poisoned the minds of people, quote, out there. Thus, 
Party leaders have retreated from the countryside to focus entirely on big urban areas. Democratic congressional leaders even killed their rural outreach programs, and the party's chairman in 2018 meekly declared, you can't door knock in rural America. Actually, sir, you can. And if you choose to abandon this working class constituency, surprise, it will abandon you. Worse than failing to campaign along America's dirt roads and factory streets, National Democrats have actively been pushing corporate policies that have ravaged families living there, including trade scams sucking out union jobs, shamefully bailing out Wall Street bankers who crashed our real economy while ignoring millions of devastated workaday people, and doing nothing about the corporate cause farm depression still ripping across our land. Washington Democrats have largely betrayed this vital constituency. This is Jim Hightower saying, did party poobahs think voters wouldn't notice or care how they're being treated? If we want them back on our side, then let's go to them and get back on their side. Howdy ho, folks. Thanks for tuning in and sharing my weekly commentaries. Also, please join me for a live web show I host every other Tuesday, the Hightower Lowdown Happy Hour at the Chat and Chew Cafe. You can join the action live online as I chat with grassroots leaders and progressive sparklies from around the country. Go to HightowerLowdown.org slash chat and chew to find out about upcoming guests and watch past episodes. That's HightowerLowdown.org slash chat and chew. Welcome to 60 Second Civics from the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. The United States is a representative democracy. We are also a republic, meaning that the people choose our representatives at the local, state, and national levels, and these representatives make the laws, rules, and regulations that strongly affect our daily lives. Elections have consequences. So if you want to say in the political future of our nation, it is up to you to get involved. Luckily, there are many ways to accomplish this. The first and most basic level is by voting. Unfortunately, a third of Americans did not bother to vote in the last presidential election, giving up their right to choose the president. But you don't have to be a statistic. Voting is easy, but there are a few requirements. All states except North Dakota require you to register to vote. Visit vote.gov to learn how to register and vote in your state. Another way to get involved is by joining a political party. Political parties exist in order to bring like-minded people together to advocate for their political beliefs and get their candidates elected. Many local communities have organizations that support major political parties, and you can join them for free or for a small fee. Finally, you can influence the outcome of elections by volunteering for a political campaign. This might mean making phone calls, sending text messages, or attending fundraisers. Contact your favorite candidate via their website in the months before an election to get started. These are only some of the ways to get involved in determining the future of our country. The first step is just getting started. Your contribution could make all the difference. This episode was made possible by the support of T-Mobile. 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, Pinkerton detectives arrived at job sites across the U.S. to escort workers off the premises. No, it was not a railroad or a coal mine in labor's distant past. It was at the offices of what was once the largest computer seller in the United States. And the year was 2000. Inacom was filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. The computer giant had been built on buying computers in large quantities and reselling them. But increasingly, computer manufacturers such as Dell began to sell directly to customers. They eliminated the middleman. Unable to adapt, Inacom's finances were a wreck. They brought in the Pinkertons to usher away employees and change the locks on the office doors. The Pinkertons arrived at the Atlanta office at 2.30. They showed up in Jacksonville at 4. Another former employee recalled his experience saying on June 16th, they came into the Buffalo office around five with Pinkerton security and a locksmith and said, basically, you've got five minutes to grab your personal belongings and leave the building. The bewildered employees were given few answers. The Pinkertons posted signs with an 800 number on the doors they had just locked. 
Then, at 4.26 p.m., more than 5,000 employees were sent an email from the company asking them to call that same number. When they did, a recorded message began to explain the events of the day. The employees learned that they would not receive their final paychecks, and they had all been fired. But the news got worse. The message went on, We advise you begin exploring alternatives for medical and disability insurance. The message also said, Intercom apologizes for the sudden disruption and expresses its appreciation for your dedicated service. Employees were left to scramble for new jobs and insurance without any warning whatsoever. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River, in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Expecting a high of, uh, well, about 71, 72, so quite a bit lower than yesterday, because yesterday we were in the mid-80s. So maybe we'll end up in the mid-70s, but it's still a bit of a drop from yesterday. Cloudy throughout the day with winds out of the west-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Showers this evening. Becoming a steady rain overnight, bringing with it about a quarter inch of rain with lows in the low 50s and winds out of the west-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And then cloudy with occasional rain showers tomorrow, bringing with it something a little bit less than a quarter inch. And highs will be in the mid-60s with winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon have been updated. Wonder of wonders. Unfortunately, we are increasing once again. We do have a recommendation from the state to wear masks indoors and outdoors because of precipitous spikes in infections in three counties in which Jackson County is one. And it only means one thing. No one around here ever took the pandemic seriously. That's why we lead the state in deaths and infections. I'm wearing a mask. I continue. It's not over. Right now, we stand at 456,014 confirmed cases and our deceased have increased by three, and we now stand at 548. Grass pollen is rated very high right here in Rogue River. The air quality index for the Rogue River Valley region is good at 29 parts per million, and the daytime UV index is very high at level nine. Do take care. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 29.94 inches. Visibility is at 10 miles and relative humidity is at 75%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is a very warm 84 degrees and sunny. Paris is an equally very warm 86 and sunny. Rome is an exceedingly warm 90 degrees and fair with a heat advisory that may impact critical electrical infrastructure, by the way. Kiev is 75 and partly cloudy. Kabul is 74 degrees and clear. Hong Kong is 84 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 70 degrees and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 56 and clear. San Francisco, California is 56 degrees and fair. And New York, New York is 68 degrees Fahrenheit 
and mostly cloudy. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. Washington Post brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Federal agents have begun questioning U.S. technology companies on how their computer chips ended up in Russian military equipment recovered in Ukraine. Commerce Department agents who enforce export controls are conducting the inquiries together with the FBI, paying joint visits to companies to ask about Western ships and components found in Russian radar systems, drones, tanks, ground control equipment, and literal ships, according to people familiar with the matter. Our goal is to actually try to track that back, all the way back to the U.S. supplier to determine how did it find its way into that weapon system, one Commerce Department official said of the probes. Just because a chip, a company's chip, is found in a weapon system doesn't mean we've opened up an investigation on that company. What we've done, the official said, is we've opened up an investigation on how that company's chip got into that system. It is not clear which specific components are being probed, but investigators from a variety of countries have identified Western electronics in Russian weaponry found in Ukraine. Many of those components appear to have been manufactured years ago before the United States tightened export restrictions after Russia seized Crimea in 2014. But others were manufactured as recently as 2020, according to Conflict Armament Research, a research group in London that has examined some of the parts. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Samuel Petroquin and Jill Lawless of the Associated Press bring us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The European Union sued Britain yesterday, Wednesday, over his move to rewrite the trade rules agreed to when the country left the EU two years ago, ratcheting up tensions between the major economic partners. Earlier this week, Boris Johnson's government proposed legislation that would remove customs checks on some goods entering Northern Ireland from the rest of the U.K., Those checks were imposed as part of a hard-fought compromise when Britain left the EU and its borderless free trade zone, but have caused both economic and political problems in Northern Ireland, where some say they undermine the region's place in the United Kingdom. The EU has decried Britain's effort to rip up part of the deal. The EU's decision to pursue legal action raises the possibility that either or both sides could impose punishing tariffs on the other. The EU refused to rule out such a move on Wednesday, but the prospect of a trade war still seemed a distant possibility since both would suffer and have said they want to find a solution outside of the courts. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for 
Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks, and we will meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver